Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for tonight's presentation, Automation and the Flight Envelope, brought to you by Bendix King and Social Flight. My name is Jeff Simon. I'm president of Social Flight. For those of you joining us for the first time, Social Flight is the free web and mobile app dedicated to supporting general aviation. Visit socialflight.com or download the Social Flight mobile app for Apple or Android devices, and it gives you access to tens of thousands of destinations, events, restaurants, etc., and even a weekly email with a list of things happening. Our mission is to give pilots like yourselves more reasons to get out there, fly, and support general aviation. And that's even true during these challenging times when a lot of people obviously cannot get together for in-person events. And so in addition to those types of events, we have online events such as tonight's presentation. Bendix King is one of the most iconic names in general aviation with a history that goes back to the beginning of modern avionics. As part of Honeywell, they produce avionics for nearly every segment of aviation, including transponders and ADS-B products, and they've also been a thought leader in our community. And that's why we're here tonight. As a social flight partner, Bendix King wanted to help us provide awareness and education about how autopilots and the technology in our cockpits affect our performance and safety as pilots. And I think that's incredibly important. Even at times like this, we have to, as a population of general aviation pilots, maintain our proficiency, maintain our ability to fly, and be there to serve our communities uh, through general aviation. And so I'd just like to thank them in advance for their support and making tonight's presentation possible. Now, before we get started, here's just a few tips. First of all, a recording of tonight's presentation will be available on socialflight.com. Within 24 hours, we will send you a link after the presentation that will help you do that. The uh, webinar can be found uh, the next day on our YouTube channel, so just search for Social Flight, one word, on YouTube if you'd like to catch up on some of these details or see something if uh, you're having any uh, issues with connecting. So also, feel free to post questions during the presentation, and we'll do our best to address those questions uh, uh, by integrating them into the presentation, and uh, if uh, there's time and if appropriate, at the end, addressing some of them as well. There is a Q&A feature directly in the, uh, the webinar software. So post something there, and then that will uh, make it easy for us to do that. So with that, I would like to uh, just get started. Um, Quick little overview, we have a really, really uh, wonderful uh, kind of trifecta of, of people coming from different backgrounds for tonight's presentation. Uh, I come from the maintenance avionics, avionics industry side, pilot and aircraft owner, and I'm also the maintenance columnist for AOPA Online. My uh, life has been dedicated to promoting owner-assisted aircraft maintenance and helping people uh, discover that they can own aircraft and how to do that as efficiently as possible. I've experienced working with the FAA, with SDCs and PMAs for many products, including uh, the Flexport Multifunction Enunciator and Beechcraft modifications. And of course, we're here because of social flight. And if I were to turn around behind me right now, I would uh, be looking at a T-51D Mustang project that is being built right here in our living room. So I love all things aviation, and, and I'm thrilled to be here tonight and do what I can to contribute. And what's really exciting is I'm joined by these two incredibly experienced and wonderful individuals. Uh, it starts with my good friend, Andrew Barker, who uh, is really one of the most iconic names uh, in uh, the autopilot industry. Most of you know him from True Track, now with Bendix King. And uh, Andrew is someone who literally just started uh, at the at the almost like up the up on the bottom up the ranks as an engineer coming into the true track moving through the ranks and eventually then owning the business and uh, uh, for any of you who have met Andrew at shows or otherwise you certainly understand why there is a uh, a hat and boots uh, representing uh, who he is uh, there. And, and I would encourage any of you who have a chance to spend any time with Andrew to uh, please do so and, and bring your questions and soak up as much of the expertise as you can. Um, uh, I, I am really fortunate to consider him a, a friend and someone that I've learned a, an immense amount from over the years. So welcome, Andrew. Are you on the line? Yes, I'm here. Thank you so much sir, for uh, all the kind lies. <laughs> well, and, and they're, they're not, li not lies at all. And so coming from, we've got, let's see, we, we, we've got the maintenance aspect that I'm bringing. We've got how you actually 
uh, create autopilots and certify them and go through this from that perspective. And we're also fortunate to have Mary Ellen Coupe with us. Mary Ellen is also a close friend of mine and, and just an incredibly experienced aviation individual uh, that's coming from the flight instructor side and, the, and the, uh, everything that goes into how you learn about flying and how you can practice this craft to an art. Mary Ellen holds a commercial multi-engine instrument flight instructor rating, which is a mouthful to say. She's a seaplane instructor. She's a tail dragger work. I mean, it, it just... You, I'll tell you, it, you can spend hours if you're able to uh, track her down at a show or otherwise learning about all the facets of aviation uh, that she brings to the table. And again, from how you operate these avionics safely and what it means to the flight envelope of the aircraft, uh, this is really the person. And I'm thrilled to have uh, this group here talking to you uh, tonight. So, uh, Mary Ellen, welcome as well. Thank you so much. It was wonderful. I get a hat though, like Andrew. <laughs> no, I like having the picture of you there. So let's let's jump right into it. And um, you know, tonight's presentation about automation and the operational envelope of the aircraft. What we're talking about here is the entire concept of how we fly an aircraft within its limitations versus how the autopilot flies the aircraft, and then how we integrate the feedback and the guidance that we get from the avionics. Because I think this is an incredibly important distinction of understanding the equipment that's involved and, and, and knowing that, monitoring properly, and understanding the limits and automation. And so, Marielle, if you could speak to some of the details here of what matters, uh, I think we can have a good conversation about that. Absolutely. Thank you, Jeff. You know, on uh, know thy equipment, on all these wonderful pieces of equipment that help us with our workload. It's added into our panels and into our everyday life. It can be, uh, it can be very confusing with the different visual cues, audio cues, and OEMs, the subtle changes and differences. So it's really important for you, especially as you add equipment to your aircraft, you really understand what the what the equipment is saying to you, and when you give an input, what you the response is, and is it giving the the exact response that you want? And if you lack understanding of the equipment, you're not going to trust the equipment either. So of course, the air is a great place to practice, but on the ground is the best place to read about these, and to sit in your airplane and listen to the little sounds. And we'll talk. We'll talk about right. that and, a and little bit more. And let me chime in for just a second. When we talk about the equipment here that feeds into it, I think it's important to kind of review what that really means. And so we talked about the autopilot is the, uh, is the one instrument that is directly controlling the aircraft itself. The other uh, things that go in there feed into that. We talk about flight directors, which guide the pilot. We talk about aeroflight, the, the navigate, universal navigation comm system that provides the information that can guide the autopilot on courses and on approaches. We have angle of attack indicators that give us feedback about uh, you know, what, as, what the wing is actually experiencing in terms of its lift reserve. And when we talk about autopilots, we have other parts of it like CWS, which stands for control wheel steering and trim, a yaw dampener, which is often part of that, and then the other feedback that we actually get uh, to our, uh, as, as pilots. And so understanding all of uh, that equipment and how it's actually controlling the autopilot, I think is a key starting point there that then leads into the things that uh, you were talking about, which I'd love to learn more about with active monitoring and what the limits and automation are. Thank you, yes, absolutely. So when we hand fly aircraft, of course, we're flying and monitoring at the same time. Workload, it seems okay because we're balancing the workload, but then as tasks get a little bit more saturated, that's where the automation can come in to help us. But when we start adding in the automation on there, we are only letting go of pilot flying. We are always monitoring the situation. We're always monitoring the equipment. We seem to, uh, within the industry, kind of 
hand over too much to what automation is doing. And I think, Jeff, you had a wonderful example that uh, I would love for you to talk about uh, with the autopilot that kind of explains the monitoring aspect of it. Yeah, um, you know, we were talking offline earlier, and I brought up a story that uh, that was really enlightening to me. Uh, uh, Social Flights uh, has a, a A36 uh, Bonanza that uh, that I fly with an older autopilot uh, that's uh, attached to it, and I've been flying IFR for uh, for quite a while. Um, I, I don't fly a fair a, a lot of what I'd consider to be really hard IFR down to down to minimums. Um, but but certainly have become comfortable. And at the same time, it's amazing what can become a, a wake-up call in what your role is as a pilot flying these systems. And so I was taking a, a trip with my family on board. And so obviously the stakes get, uh, you know, we think of the stakes as being pretty high at that point. And uh, we were climbing out in the Boston area uh, uh, in IMC conditions. And getting a, a, a fair amount of redirection, you know, new altitudes, new headings, uh, new clearances, a lot going on. And I had the autopilot uh, flying the aircraft at the, uh, at the time, giving it guidance uh, because of all the changes in headings with a heading bug uh, changes and with the trim wheel of uh, sending it to uh, telling it essentially how to keep getting the climb that, uh, that I needed. As, as we keep trying to go to higher and higher altitudes that we were being issued. Now, what was, uh, uh, while all this was going on, all of a sudden, I started hearing a chirp. Uh, and when I looked over, I saw that my airspeed had dramatically declined, and that chirp was the beginning stages of the stall warning going off. And so... This is something I have never experienced before in uh, IMC conditions, flying with my autopilot, et cetera. The aircraft's got 300 horsepower on board. And being able to, to climb out and always be able to get uh, 500 to 1,000 feet per minute or something, you know, really good climb rates, I just got comfortable with. What I hadn't realized that had occurred during this time is that even though uh, uh, it was, uh, I wasn't getting knocked around, I was in the middle of a stable, smooth downdraft that was happening in these IMC conditions. And without thinking about it, I continued to command the autopilot to just keep climbing, just keep climbing more, because we've got to go further up. We've got to go f further up in what we're being given. And I had lapsed uh, on my duties of actively monitoring my autopilot system to the point that the aircraft was in danger of stalling. And uh, that's, I think, a really, really important thing. We'll talk later in this presentation, about, uh, with, uh, especially with Andrew's input, about what the autopilots are designed to do and, and what level of safety is, is built in, especially with the older autopilots like the ones that, uh, that I had. And uh, it was a wake-up call. It really was about the difference between uh, doing things the way you, you're used to and expecting those results, which we've all read you know, horrible stories about uh, uh, having to do with people making that mistake. Um, I did not suffer the consequences, but I learned a valuable lesson. Yeah, thank you. So, which leads me to limitations in automation. Like we're all taught when we learn to fly the PAVE and a lot of other acronyms in there as well. But our, the pilot, I'm going to present PAVE in a different way that also shows the relativity of automation in the PAVE environment so that you can kind of get a better idea or a different outlook of how automation can help you or when to use the appropriate levels uh, of automation within your flight. And of course, the aircraft include all the automation within there. The environment is completely fluidic. It's always changing around you. External pressures, those stay the same, especially now. We have a lot of them now. So we're going to kind of do a, a bit of a segue to talk about pre-flighting all that equipment first and then get into that model. So this is uh, Andrew and Jeff, I believe this is, yeah. uh, this is you. So, yeah, the, and thanks, Mary Ellen. Sorry if I switched a little early there. The, no, that's right. Well, you know, the first step in, in having command of your aircraft and your systems, as opposed to them commanding you, uh, is with testing them and testing them on the ground. And so this is something that I am really, it's required 
uh, by the way, in terms of uh, the way the checklists are done and what you're supposed to do in pre-flight before you take off, especially with autopilot checkouts. And yet, uh, it's really not something that's all that commonly practiced in the field. And so I would really encourage people to do this on the ground. Autopilots are designed to be tested on the ground. The same way that we look and see about like uh, is uh, has the, the attitude indicator properly erected in front of us? So is our vacuum pump uh, working properly? When we turn, is the, the ball free to go back and forth? Uh, uh, for, for coordinating our turns. We, we do these things in, in normal pre-flight, but a lot of people do not test their autopilot. And so this is something that, again, I've experienced where I've been on the ground, done a test before flying and engaged it, turned it, and found one of the servos didn't engage. Something was wrong with the wiring at one point, and in, 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 uh, there was a connector that was loose in my aircraft. And this is, this is, it's certainly the stakes are a little lower if you're flying VFR, but if you're about to launch into IMC, the last thing that you should be doing is finding out if your autopilot is operating properly, turning the servos and everything centered as soon as you enter IMC and decide to hand over control of that aircraft to the autopilot. And one of the interesting things that happens when you, uh, when you do this test is it also gives you that opportunity to configure the autopilot before you take off in a way that makes sense. And this means making sure that you don't have uh, a vertical climb rate or a speed rate or some rate set in there that doesn't make sense. Making sure that the heading bug or your turn indicator or bank setting is straight and level with what you're doing so there's no surprises. Uh, I think that's one of the themes that we're going to hear throughout the presentation is how do you always know exactly what's going to happen so that your actions as a pilot match what the autopilot is going to do when it takes over. And if I just want to break in here for a minute, sorry, Andrew, you're just going to have to wait a minute. Um, on the pre-flight, this by testing your equipment on the ground, this also gives you a really great a pathway or transition into your flight environment. When you're focused in on what the on what your equipment is doing, how it's responding, you're monitoring, you're starting to monitor the system so that you can then be brushed up on, oh yeah, I remember that visual cue, that audible cue, and that it helps to shift from the tactical than the visual that's going to be up in the air. Right. Definitely. And I, and I can't emphasize enough the configuration aspect of this. Um, we think about things like putting uh, your avionics into, into GPSS mode, for example, so that you're going to be tracking uh, a course as opposed to uh, a heading, figuring out if that's the right mode you want to be in, um, getting all of these things should be done while you're on the ground before you're doing it so that when you press that button, you're engaging and it's doing that proper tracking. You shouldn't engage and then chase it. And I will say I have seen so, so many times pilots do that where they are in a critical flight situation. They engage an autopilot first and then redirect what it's doing second. So at that point, I'd like to um, hand this over uh, to this cave pyramid with Mary Ellen. Oh, thank you. So think of the uh, the pave model in the pyramid, and this is the automation pyramid. So when you're on the ground, uh, the pilot, you provide the foundation, the baseline for everything, uh, the rest of the pave model. The airplane, the environment, the external pressures, as you see there, it's all building upon your foundation. So at the point, Everything that you're going to be doing in that airplane is all observational, it's all forecast, it's all planning, it's doing the testing of the equipment, it's getting everything back to the front of your memory of, oh yes, it does this, it does this. you know, I, I need to check the oil, you know, you're, you're monitoring everything, but it's all tactile, meaning you're touching everything in that airplane, including the equipment, you're getting it all um, ready to go for the environment. And so uh, I have on there the last bullet point, you know, also reminds you of any known issues or little quirks that you may have at your avionics because that adds external pressure because it's always going to be there. 
So by thinking about this differently, that pace is always with you. And the interesting thing happens then, Jeff, if you want to move ahead, is when you shift sure, and, to the and, air. And, oh, I'm sorry. Please. I just want to let you know you're, you're breaking up just a tiny bit on it, uh, uh, so oh, you might sorry. need to uh, speak a little slower. The, uh, but I do want to add one thing to this, and that is, you know, you made an interesting point about those known concerns about avionics. So I'm going to put my maintenance hat and chime in on this. Um, it is, uh, I, I have encountered many, many times uh, uh, people uh, with their aircraft, and, and myself has been included in the past, where there are things that we know that is a problem with our aircraft or with our avionics. And if, if they're reproducible and we absolutely know what's going on, well, then, of course, we, we always successfully get them repaired. But we also sometimes come across things that uh, we might think of as kind of the, the gremlin problem, where uh, every once in a while, something thing weird happens and we haven't been able to solve this problem. We haven't been able to reproduce it or get the avionics shop to solve it. If, if you have something like that, I mean, years ago I had a problem with a, a uh, all of a sudden I know where the trim would start to creep up and, until it could break out and, and was causing trouble for the autopilot. Couldn't reproduce it enough to get it repaired because no one, they could never see it. My point about this is, to, to Mary Ellen's point about this model, you bring that uh, with you as baggage into your flight, that you now have to monitor something going on and are at risk of, uh, of, of something happening, and you just have to make sure you realize that that's there and that it just adds to your workload before that flight and during um, that this is happening. And with that, um, at takeoff, hand flying. So you're using you as the technology, the flying and the monitoring. And so as you get further away from the ground, then you start adding in levels of automation that are appropriate to where you are within that flight regime. So you automatic, well, maybe you do, I don't know, but maybe, you know, you just add uh, the flight director, so you're still flying. Now you're starting to introduce the technology into your environment. And as you get further away from the ground, and you start adding more technology, keep that in mind, that simplicity of using the technology uh, to back off on the technology in a, in a changing environment, because it may not help you. You know, you might get overloaded oversaturated, and then lose situational awareness. A lot of high-profile accidents that really emphasize that point. But then when you fly, notice that that uh, cave pyramid, um, I just lost the screen, I don't know if everybody else did, but um, when it inverts, uh, as you get into the environment, those external pressures, those are still with you, and that creates delicate excuse me, pivot point, that now the pilot becomes the person balancing everything in the air. So if you shift one way or the other, you're just trying to keep everything in balance. The automation, then you notice that it's below the pilot. That automation will help, uh, provides the bridge between a pilot and the environment, because the environment is always changing. Now you're really into the reality. The winds are different than you forecast. There may be turbulence. There are storms, you know, depending on where you fly, popping up or embedded all around you. There's a lot of other things going on, the systems within the aircraft. So using that automation to help keep a buffer between you and the changing environment and you as the pilot monitoring, you're always monitoring your environment, but also you're monitoring the automation. You're not letting go. You just hand over the physical touching of a yoke or a stick uh, so that it can help you monitor the aircraft. So um, I don't know, Jeff or Andrew, if you wanted to add anything to that, but a different way to look at PAVE and to assess. Uh, and you notice it, it's no, um, it wasn't a mistake to have this look like an attitude indicator. 
because then as you step down the ladder, then as you get closer to the ground, you want to be able to shed the automation, of course, unless you're in hard, hard IFR and then you're using the automation to have you step down. But also note that the automation may exceed what your, um, as we call personal minimums, if you have any of those or not really dusting of your equipment yet, or your airplane, or the environment, you know, or in any number of reasons, the technology doesn't know what your minimums are. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later, our perception and reality of the equipment. Yeah, that's great. I, I, I appreciate that. And I like the visual of it because it really does kind of show that you built the foundation on the ground for what you experience in the air. And, and that, that foundation is, is your safety net for how you are then able to conduct your flight, what you're able to rely on. And then when you get back to the so, ground, it's back on you again. Exactly. So uh, I'd like to bring Andrew in now and talk a little bit about uh, how autopilots are built and what this you know, really means. Because one of the interesting things that the foundation for uh, uh, I, you know, everything we've been talking about when we even built this presentation is the difference between how people generally fly their aircraft in relation to the limits, in relation to the flight envelope, versus how the autopilot actually flies it, and how important it is to match those two things for the safety of your flight and understand why an autopilot flies one way and how you fly. So, um, uh, Andrew? Yeah, absolutely. Man, you guys are doing such a great job on this. I am, um, I'm so impressed. <laughs> I, I am, I'm just so incredibly pleased with um, the direction this is going, the, the topics that, that we're covering here. This is such important information um, to me. I, I eat, breathe, sleep, live autopilot and aviation world. And, and for me, it's really, really important to not become reliant upon this technology. I, I love it. I trust my life to it. I trust my children's lives to it. But what we're talking about here today is how can we use this technology to benefit us, not to become a crutch. And, and this is really such a, a, a really important topic to me. So um, how autopilots fly? You know, we have to look at the the expectations, the, the needs of the, and, and I'm, I'm kind of, I got to be careful here because I'm about to step on one of my other slides, but <laughs> um, we have to make sure that the autopilot's going to do what we want it to do when we want it to do it. And Jeff was talking earlier about getting, you know, get in the aircraft and, and Mario and both get in the aircraft on the ground and get used to your autopilot, turn it on, command turns, command climbs, know what it's going to do um, so, that, so that you can really be familiar with what's it going to do when I do this. When, you know, when you look at the way an autopilot flies the airplane, it's going to fly in, in a lot of cases, unless it has a yaw damper, right? It's going to fly with its feet flat on the floor because it's not controlling the, the azimuth axis of the aircraft. So I've gotten so many calls over the years from customers saying, oh, my my autopilot in track mode flies with a wing down. And the, the response I say to that customer is, how does the airplane fly when you're flying with just your hands on the yoke and no feet on the rudder? And the answer is, of course, the exact same way because you're not stepping on the ball to, to center it and bring that wing up. So there's just some things in there that we just don't typically think about uh, what an autopilot is capable of doing. Um, so really, it's important to know that that stuff. You know, when does an autopilot turn off? You know, there's a lot of safety modes built into modern autopilots. Uh, a lot of the older autopilots, some of the issues that, that Jeff was speaking about, you know, a modern autopilot would help protect you through some of those things. It can't it can't know every situation and, you know, exactly what's coming around the corner because um, it's its sensor set is more limited actually than the pilots. But really it's important to know when is my autopilot going to disconnect on its own? In some cases they may not. You know, that that continuing to pull back on the yoke, getting closer and closer and closer to that stall, uh, you know, a distracted pilot can absolutely stall the aircraft with the autopilot. Uh, even in modern autopilots, airspeed's a great way for us to limit things, but it's not an end-all be-all. You can stall the aircraft in 
in any attitude, right? And at any airspeed, technically speaking. So it's it's really important to know those limits, climb and bank angle limits. Uh, you know, what's my autopilot? Again, what's my autopilot going to do if I have a heading bug set? You know, it's not so much the case in modern autopilots because a lot of them actually sync the heading bug to my current direction. Um, but there's also a lot of cases when that's not going to happen. So, you know, those limits of how much how much climb can I command before the autopilot protects me? What are my bank angle limits that the um, autopilot is going to protect me from and fly through? You know, rules for capture is another really, really big thing. Uh, you know, as a pilot, we can capture a glide slope from above. I don't know that there's a lot of situations that it's recommended, but but we can do those things. Autopilots are designed to be much more limited in that they want a nice, stable platform, a stable approach as we're coming in to, to join, uh, you know, BOR localized RILS signals. So you got to be really careful and make sure that you know exactly how your autopilot's going to capture in those situations. Um, What's the best way for knowing that? And <laughs> uh, Honestly, the, the, the pilot's manuals, the, the pilot's guides are really good, good ways to, to do that. I'd say as a general rule, in general aviation at least, um, we don't couple from above. I, I, I can't say that I can speak for all autopilots, but I can generally say everything that I know of, uh, and somebody will make me a liar and that's totally acceptable. Um, we want to be in altitude hold or in, in attitude hold below the glide slope and stable before we engage those uh, those modes to capture. Um, because the autopilot, there's there's so much risk in an autopilot, right? If we're above a glide slope, and as the pilot, you can know it's down there, but the autopilot doesn't. If it doesn't see a deflection or a deviation or a valid signal, then the autopilot's not gonna know that that glide slope is there and it could drive you straight into the ground. The opposite direction of of what Jeff faced, but maybe the even more scary one right and and you know we'll talk about it later a little bit about like how to practice some of these things but it really really is is critical to understand what the autopilot will do and what it won't do because in all those different flight situations you mentioned the capture part for example uh, both the laterally let's say and as well as vertically that you know most autopilots will require to you to be stable will require you to have a and they usually have a timer on it of how long you have to be in like an altitude hold mode and below the glide slope before it will then come in and then capture and that if you don't know what those limits are then you're almost waiting for a surprise at the end to see is it going to do it or am i about to do it uh and you'd never do that with another co with a co-pilot never wait till the last second and say hey let's wait and see when this needle gets to center um i'll let you know if i'm going to be the one to go down the glide slope or you are and, Absolutely. Uh, and that's exactly how a lot of them how a lot of them actually actually fly and the same is true i've been i was taking a um i was flying an approach uh, uh, IFR into Oshkosh at AirVenture one year, and everyone's getting vectored all over the place. And it, what ended up happening is we were actually being brought in at an angle that was beyond what the autopilot was able to do. And it, same thing. I got surprised by the fact the autopilot, when I thought it was about to join the course and, they, and, and start the final approach, actually said, um, no, you know what? You take this one. <laughs> Exactly. Another great case of let's practice beyond our normal comfort zone, but let's do it in VMC. Let's say, all right, you know what? Let's let's simulate an approach where I'm going to get a a vector to couple that's beyond 30 or 45 degrees, which is kind of the standard for an autopilot. You know, as as a pilot, a 60 degree couple, it's not ideal, but it's it's something you could do quite comfortably. But the autopilot's just not designed to couple in those situations. At least, again, I will I will say blanket approach here. Most autopilots are not. Some some may, but in in general aviation, it, it's it's really important to know what your system is capable of. And and again, a lot of that is isn't it should be in the POH, um, but some of those things may not be well documented in in POH in POHs, especially for some of the older um, older systems that are out there. So the, the best advice that, that I have when you're to find out what your autopilot is going to do, A, fly it on the ground, right? Those, those are really cheap flight hours. 
Um, but also get up in DMC and practice your, your coupled approaches and not just the normal, easy, straightforward ones. Let's throw some complex stuff at the system while you're a, a system monitor when things aren't happening that are going to overwhelm you near as much. And I'd like to add one other last thing, and that is I think one of the most important uh, things to check has to do with what Andrew mentioned earlier, which is when is your autopilot going to break off? And that can happen for a number of reasons. It can happen, uh, for example, if you have an autopilot where you also have uh, 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 either an auto trim uh, built into it or even with manual trim where the trim gets out of sync to, with the autopilot to the point that the autopilot breaks off what it's doing. And when that, I can tell you when that happens, because I've experienced it, it is a, a very dramatic and can be a very scary situation. Because not only is your autopilot kicking off, but it's kicking off in a in a radically over uh, compensated position, well, uh, that you're not coordinated. Where all of a sudden, what you thought was happening with the plane is that the autopilot was keeping you straight and level, and everything was fine. And what it was actually doing was fighting like hell against the trim pressures to hold your plane level. And when it gives up, all of a sudden the yoke goes straight back to you or straight forward and you go into a, a pretty radical move uh, in, a, in a very dangerous situation. And that's exactly the type of things we talk about with VFR pilots all the time of don't make a, you know, tight turns, radical moves. They, that's what introduces danger. And when your autopilot will kick off, whether that is based on a command that you're giving it, whether it's based on not being uh, in sync, uh, with your trim or, some, or or just not being able to, to finish an approach or guidance or having discontinuity in your nav system. There's so many ways it can happen that you really need to understand them and understand what would cause that to happen and what how the airplane is going to get configured when the autopilot hands it back to you, uh, perhaps without you knowing it was coming. Yeah, and be able to hang on to that yoke and make sure that you, you come back to that lower automation state where you're flying and monitoring and then build it back up again. Now, Marianne, what do you, you recommend? Uh, you know, I've always had the habit personally of uh, never being comfortable flying the aircraft uh, on autopilot without my hand touching the yoke in some way. What's your, uh, what do you teach your students anything having to do with that? Um, no, it really depends. It depends on the person and their response time and what they're comfortable with. I mean, it's, the autopilot is also going to be fighting against the weight. If I tend to have a heavy hand, you know, just left hand, if it's yoke, you know, and, and sinking the left hand down, then it's just the, you know, I may disengage it or th there could be a number of things. So I just can be as close to the controls as possible, but I'm not going to be like in a, you know, ready to hit position, like in skiing, something like that. It's just, you know, I think I've just, been bitten. I think I've been bitten too hard. <laughs> <laughs> a little tense. Are you in the cockpit? There, Jeff? No. Well, uh, you have a couple hard overs by your autopilot. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, you, you learn to get really comfortable with your hand, your arm on the armrest and your, and your thumb just just ready for it if you're uh, once bitten twice shy in my case <laughs> exactly you know it's part of the style of flying some people like to have yep. you know like they're holding a teacup they're barely touching the top of the oak you know and it's, it looks very simple you know but it's just a matter of what are you ready to respond to and just be ready for it because when it goes so you Andrew, know I think we, uh, it, it's very good. I think we um, the slide. We can get you back. To no, no, no. Here. You're good. No, you're totally fine. This is all good stuff. Um, it and and to that point, it's very dependent on the phase of flight that I'm in, as to how much leeway I'm going to give the automation in the aircraft. You know, if I, if I'm flying an approach, I'm right there with it every moment, no matter what. Um, and and that's just because it we're we're close to the ground. Stuff happens quickly at that point. If I'm up in cruise, it's BMC, it's severe clear. Yeah, I, I am probably not going to have my hand on the yoke or stick, or you know, I'll probably at least be in my seat. But uh, <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> I, I, I um, 
it, it's really, really heavily dependent on phase of flight as to really how much leeway I'm going to give the automation. I won't even just say the autopilot, but automation in general in the aircraft. So can you talk a little bit about the difference in autopilots when you build an autopilot with uh, uh, envelopes and, and how that fits in, especially, you know, with the older autopilots versus the modern ones that uh, that you build at Bendix King? Uh, yes, absolutely. So it, it's so much different today um, than, than it was even just a, a handful of years ago. You know, the, the technology has advanced so much. The sensors that we have access to, you know, the ability to have, software in the in the system to do a lot of these things it gives us a lot of capability to add ridiculous amounts of safety into the system you know for example airspeed limiting bank angle limiting um you know just things that we you know bank angle limiting is in there but we can have an autopilot that is intelligent even when it's not engaged and knows hey the aircraft is leaving its expected flight envelope maybe the pilot should be warned about this more than just an alert on the on the on the panel maybe we can give them some feeling in the stick or or something like that so we can do things with modern systems that just really weren't even i don't want to say possible but they certainly wouldn't have been affordable you know the cost of a modern autopilot today versus the cost of a modern autopilot 30 40 years ago is already significantly less not just in terms of what your dollar amount bought but the capability of those autopilots is greater than uh, what the capability was before. And then you add in things like, like envelope protection, airspeed limiting, um, the emergency level type of things where you push the button and it recovers the aircraft to, to a level uh, flight attitude. We can do those things today very affordably. In fact, a lot of the sensors that we're gonna be using in the autopilot uh, are, are already in the aircraft for, for other purposes in a lot of cases. Now, some of our autopilots are complete standalone systems, uh, and some of them utilize the, the same Atahars that would be used to fly, to, to drive, excuse me, the, 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 the PFD as well. So a lot of that information is already in the aircraft, kind of like what we had in the past, but we just have more of it. And having more access to more information about what's going on in the aircraft lets us build a safer system. So it, it, it is, quite impressive the amount of safety and and we just keep adding more and more to it and and i'm really excited about getting some some more fun stuff into the autopilots in the coming years um with with that technology you know now look at prime examples look at aoa aoa is really the best thing we have for stall prevention but you add aoa and knowledge of whether we're flying an approach and how close we are to the ground and things like that we can make a system that really helps protect us now, we're still PIC, and, and Mary, Mary Ellen will absolutely speak to this. You're still PIC. You still are monitoring all of these systems. But it lets us create an even safer um, level of automation as well. That's an interesting perspective of, of the idea of, of building AOA directly into auto, autopilot control. Uh, I mean, when you think about how an approach could be flown, the idea of, of using that instead of airspeeds or instead of just looking at your course guidance is extraordinarily promising and obviously it compensates for for uh, gross weight of the aircraft uh, everything uh, the wing always knows what the wing knows exactly and right back to that you can stall it at any airspeed in any attitude but you always stall at the same AOA per configuration of course so um one of the things, of course, as you mentioned, you know, the older autopilots like the one that, that uh, <laughs> the one that I was uh, flying with obviously don't have safety limitations. And um, let's talk a little bit about what the capabilities are, because ultimately what we really want to, to understand here is the difference, again, between how, how we fly an airplane regarding the, as, a, as just a human being regarding the flight envelope versus how an autopilot thinks about flying the airplane having to do with the envelope. Yep, absolutely, exactly. You know, and and this we even within Bendix King, we have a, a pretty broad selection of, of autopilots with different capabilities, and and you know, different um, different really targets, different markets in, in mind for for what they what they you know what's your mission, what they're going to do, and I'll I'll talk about mission specific and which autopilot might fit you later on, but but really things to think about is you know, do you need an autopilot in approach mode? 
analog versus digital. We actually, uh, you know, the majority of autopilots out flying today are analog autopilots. A digital autopilot lets us add some of those safety features and stuff like that in that we've been talking about. Um, you know, rate-based versus attitude. This is a um, this is a kind of a, a pet peeve one for me. The you can have great autopilots that are both rate-based and attitude-based. It became a kind of a marketing hot point in in the past about you know attitude autopilots are better than rate-based autopilots, and and they they can be. Um, but you can also have an autopilot that flies the aircraft very, very, very well and very, very, very safely that is rate based. You know, we make autopilots that are um, actually in the past, we've made autopilots that are, are traditional, purely rate based. And when people say a rate based autopilot, what they actually generally mean is a turn coordinator type autopilot. We're talking about in the roll axis, a turn coordinator based autopilot where you have an inclined rate gyro and it's and it's that's what's driving the autopilot so the the issue and i'll put that in air quotes issue with rate based autopilots is they can be viewed and can actually fly the aircraft a little less precisely than traditional attitude based autopilots fast forward to today and a rate based autopilot uh, depending on how the rate gyros are are oriented can fly equal or better than a, an attitude autopilot could in the past so it, it's it's a little bit of a misnomer we, we really should honestly call that and I, I probably should have changed it in this slide but nobody would know what i was talking about <laughs> um should be more like turn coordinator based versus orthogonal um gyroscopic based um but that really boils down to how well is it going to fly my aircraft and a rate based autopilot is going to fly an aircraft very well at cruise speeds, you know, and the only issue you might get into is adverse yaw and low airspeed. Um, it might be a little less precise, the capability of different so autopilots. You, well, yep. Sorry. Go ahead. And Andrew, when, when, when we think about the, uh, the flight envelope itself, does uh, an, an attitude based autopilot has specific limits having to do with its its deck angle, you know, what it'll climb at and its roll angle. Is that the same for rate based autopilots? Or do they have to interpret uh, that a bit? It, is it, it can be when we think it, about it can be. It's uh, again it's gonna be very dependent on on the autopilot, the brand and or the model even in in a lot of those cases. You know, more traditionally speaking, your rate based autopilots would have a G limit switch or something like that uh, to keep the pitch axis from doing things that it shouldn't do in, in heavy turbulence or um, things of that nature. Um, your, your attitude autopilots in the past traditionally would be the ones that had more of the safety features and limits built in, whereas today it's, it's just a little bit different than that, honestly. I don't know if that really answers your question quite correctly or not. No, it does. <laughs> it, it, it definitely does. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And it all goes, and so it all what, goes back we, to uh, knowing your equipment, right? Absolutely. So Read that POH. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We want to be able to so avoid speaking all of equipment. information and do problem. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. We're, we're all a little, we like to talk. We're all a little long-winded, so um, I'll, I'll try to hurry this along just a little bit here. Um, the AeroCruise 100 and, and 230, AeroCruise 100 is, is basically what the TrueTrack uh, certified autopilot product line was. Um, these are really, uh, you know, they're, they're both great autopilots. There is some overlap in, in the aircraft that they're approved for, um, but it is really going to boil down to what's your mission? Um, you know, are you VFR? Are you IFR? You know, are are you IFR on? Are we going to let down through an occasional layer or take off through an occasional light layer? But I'm not going to fly IFR every day. Or am I using my aircraft for um, for my business and and I need to go more often? You know, am I going to be flying in hard in in heavy IMC uh, down to minimums regularly? You know, it's really mission dependent. You know, the Aero Cruise 100. It's more for that lighter end. It's it's for the VFR and what um, you know the the guys who are gonna 
not be flying coupled approaches every single time, everywhere they go, it's still a good pilot aid in some of those situations. But if you need an autopilot that's gonna get you down, fly you down the approach, be it a digital or an analog approach, the 230 is, is, the, is the big brother to, to the AeroCruise 100. Uh, you know, budget is another important thing. The, you know, and what, what you already have in your aircraft, the, the AeroCruise 230 is an upgrade to our existing uh, 150 autopilots. And here in the very near future, we'll be um, kind of touching on the last bullet point there. Uh, very near future, we'll have that to replace the, the KFC 200s as well. So not just the 150 upgrades, but also the 200 upgrades. Um, you know, is it, you know, and, and this is an affordable upgrade, but you already have an autopilot in that aircraft. You know, so really it's, it's important to know your mission, um, what's your budget, and is it, is it approved for your aircraft? You know, the AeroCruise 100 has a fairly limited install uh, base at this point in time. You know, aircraft like 172s, 175s, 177s, PA-28s, PA-32s, um, and 180s, 182s, and 185s, whereas the KFC-230 has an install base of uh, it's something like 40 or 50 different uh, models now. So a much more broad approval on on that system. Now we do have new airframes and, so, and interfaces. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Jeff. I'm sorry. I was just going to ask. So, and these are all attitude-based uh, autopilots. Um, the the 230 is absolutely a traditional. Um, well, I'll even call it a modern attitude-based autopilot because it not only has attitude, it has the some of the important things that we use that that have traditionally been viewed as kind of negative. It uses attitude, but it also uses rate uh, because that can, in, that can actually get you better flight dynamics. Now it's an orthogonal rate. It's not a, an inclined rate gyro. So you get the best of both worlds in that case. Um, so it is more like a traditional attitude-based autopilot, but with some more capabilities. Um, the AeroCruise 100 is very similar to the 230. It is, not a pure attitude based because it, it uses all of its own internal sensors. It's a little more of an instantaneous type data, which is closer related to a rate based system. But again, it's an orthogonal rate based. So you have a, a roll gyro, a pitch gyro and an azimuth gyro in these cases, as well as pressure transducers for the airspeed and, and the altitude. So they're, they, neither one of them is technically fits either of the traditional buckets of rate-based or attitude-based. They'll both fly more like a traditional attitude-based system, though. Okay, and we had one question come in, so I just want to clarify oh, sure. what, uh, having to do with attitude versus rate-based, and I just want to clarify for everyone that, you know, an at, at, what we're basically saying is that an attitude-based autopilot is one that, that, that you can think of essentially going off of your artificial horizon, off your attitude indicator. It's looking specifically at two separate axes of pitch and roll uh, versus a rate-based one, which traditionally in, in some of the older autopilots, let's say from other companies, might use the turn coordinator, which is using a single sensor at an angle, uh, which, you know, again, we're taught that uh, you're looking at uh, rate of turn. Uh, on a turn coordinator as opposed to the same thing you would get of an absolute bank angle out of your uh, of your actual uh, attitude indicator. That is absolutely 100% so correct. <laughs> Good to get one right. Um, <laughs> so we're, uh, we're getting short on time. Let's talk about flying these autopilots and then uh, really what, what our recommendations to everybody are with the flight review. Absolutely. Um, and, and I kind of already touched on this, so I'll be able to go through this one pretty quickly. You know, um, the perception here in, it's funny when we, we talk about flying, flying the aircraft, um, when we're flying VMC and, and it's severe, clear, um, everyone always says, Andrew, I want the autopilot to turn faster. I want to, you know, crank in that turn and I want to snap into that bank and snap back out of it. But the exact same pilot it's the exact same aircraft, exact same autopilot flying IMC goes, oh my gosh, now the autopilot's way too aggressive. And this is before we make any changes. It's too aggressive. It does things too quickly. It's just how kind of how we're trained to to fly in those situations. You know, I, I'm, a, I'm a fun kind of flying guy. I, I've got an RV4. That's my fun toy airplane. It's a yank and bank. You know, every time I fly it, it's got to be rolled. Um, 
So it's, it's kind of one of those kind of situations, you know, an autopilot needs to fly the aircraft the same every time because it doesn't know whether it's VMC or IMC. So we tend to design them to be a little less aggressive. Um, we we want to design an autopilot that's going to do the same thing every time. You know, they're traditionally designed for a one rate turn, things like that. Um, really, really big important thing is learn your autopilot, right? Prepare for the unusual and abnormal. Let's try to hit those corner cases. You know, don't, don't fly when you're going to fly the autopilot in VMC. Everyone knows how to fly that simple, um, you know, 30 degree intercept, uh, really simple standard approach. But when you're really in it and you really need the autopilot to help you is typically when you're flying outside of those normal situations anyway. So when you're flying those VMC approaches, yes, keep doing some of those, but make sure you get those, those corner cases in there that are more difficult um, and, and make sure that you know what the autopilot's going to do. Know what the autopilot's right. going to do. <laughs> above all else. And, and so one of the things I'd like to recommend to everyone that's, that's on and thinking about this that, that I think is, is not something people routinely do but is incredibly important is to go up and try a, a, a whole series of maneuvers that will actually uh, show you what the autopilot will do and try to tailor and match your flying directly to that. And so what I mean by that, and I'll use that as an introduction to this last slide, is when when you when you go up with your autopilot, let's take some, so there's a couple simple things. One is you could look at it and say, um, this is what's going to happen if I take my heading bug, let's say, and crank it all the way around uh, so that I'm going to do close to a 180 degree turn. Um, what bank angle is it going to do? And, is, and how coordinated is, is it going to like hold it? When is it going to roll out? How's it going to match that heading? And your flying should match that because, and here's the key, it's not because your autopilot is better pilot than you are or your autopilot does everything right. It's because you will be in, switching in and out that autopilot usage during your normal flying, especially in IMC. And if you're doing something that's dramatically different in the way you are making turns versus the way the autopilot is making turns, then when you turn it on or when you turn it off, you're going to get a, a pretty significant or you could get a significant difference in how it's pushing the envelope of the aircraft, how, what, what bank is it holding, what rate turn. You mentioned the standard rate turn that autopilots are designed to be able to do, and yet in hard IFR, a lot of some pilots uh, tend to be more conservative about that, tend to be a little less concerned, a, a little um, uh, cautious about rolling into things like that. The same can be said about actually following procedures. Go up there and, and shoot a hole or, or put your aircraft into a hold, with the autopilot, do a loop with the autopilot in the hold, and then do another loop with it yourself. See how the, to see how different it is, and try to match it, and then turn it on and see if use it as your guide, as a test. Because again, the closer you get to that, the more uh, simple it's going to be when you engage and disengage in difficult uh, situations uh, uh, along the way. And so. Um, with this, I'd certainly like to uh, obviously uh, uh, bring Mary Ellen back in. Let's talk about autopilot flight review and the Advanced Avionics Handbook. Hey, everybody. So basically, we have some ideas for you of how to create your own flight review. And what, what we would like for you to do is just create scenarios where you understand your complete avionics environment and set up um, in equipment Jenga, if you will. And by that, I mean uh, a scenario would be m to go up and fly, monitor your system in the automatic mode, and just get really comfortable with all the feedback, cues, what's, what's going on. The other thing to remember, touch with intent. Don't just touch something and then go, oh, hmm, was that what I was supposed to do? So touch with intent. Verify. That's what you did, what you expected to do, and communicate, which is also understanding your AVX environment and how all your different pieces of equipment interact with each other and communicate with each other. The second thing to do is uh, learn to control your system in failure or manual mode, like wheel steering or um, 
uh, doing off-panel disengagements, uh, forced me autopilot, you know, just coming up with all these scenarios. So I have an example, the Advanced Avionics Handbook from the FAA. You don't have to read the whole book. It's going to get redone. I'm on an FAA um, review board, the working groups. So this is one of the things that we're going to be looking at. But they do have this great checklist in the back, the Essential Skills Checklist. And you can take all these and you can then put in your avionics that you have in your airplane, your, if you rent, you know, the, the different equipment that you have in the different aircraft. But then we came up with some uh, flights that you could do on the right or some scenarios that you can do. And then work with your instructor. We love to have, we love the new equipment and different airplanes and we have to do it all the time. So it's really fun to set up a flight review that would be just on automation and have a up on that. That's all I have on that. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Appreciate that. And uh, so let's, uh, let's end with some good news having to do with pricing. Andrew, it is you, Andrew. I don't know. I don't know. I was getting ready to ask. Oh, that's probably me. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. So the good news is, if I'll pay attention, that um, we are working a 10% discount on any Bendix King product, including AeroCruise 100 and AeroCruise 230 that we've kind of featured here today. Um, this is via our My Avionics app. Uh, download the My Avionics app uh, from the the App Store. Uh, this is only available for the Apple devices at this time. But go to the download the My Avionics app, take a picture of your cockpit, enter your contact information, and we will get you an email with a 10% discount, a 10% rebate on on doing any upgrades you do for for your aircraft. Excellent. Thank you so much. And so. Um, with that, I'd like to just leave you with the contact information for both Andrew and Mary Ellen and thank everyone so much for your time this evening. We really do appreciate it. Uh, as I've said, uh, especially during these challenging times, it's really important for us to do everything that we can to remain educated and current and, and uh, do our best to learn about our aircraft. And so um, along with um, everything that we try to do here from Social Flight, I'd like to thank Bendix King and thank Andrew and Mary Ellen for their time this evening. A recording of tonight's presentation will be available on YouTube uh, uh, sometime uh, tomorrow after we're able to get it processed. And until then, thank you so much, Blue Skies.